Hi, my name is Randy Fairfield, Mr. Ed Tech. I'm a technology and instructional coach in the Richland School District, and today I'd like to share my thoughts and reflections on what it takes to be an effective integrator of technology in the classroom. Today we'll take a look at the TPAC framework, the SAMER model, and I'll also share my thoughts on the importance of having a growth mindset and being self-reflective when it comes to being an effective integrator of technology. Let's go ahead and get started. I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about this, and I think the single most important thing that it takes to be an effective integrator of technology in the classroom is to backwards plan for the results you want to see from your students in your classroom. Um, I think it's easy to be mesmerized by all of the things that we and our students can do with technology, but if we really don't spend that time backwards planning for the results that we want to see, um, things can go sideways pretty quick because we can be so mesmerized and go down rabbit trails with technology. And I think this TPAC framework here uh, that Dr. Matthew J. Kaler um, came up with, I think it does a really good job of forcing, the beauty really is in the simplicity of this framework. And I think that looking at it really forces us to ask the right questions that will help us backward backwards plan for those results we want to see from our students. So what is this framework? Uh, we have our content knowledge here, we have our pedagogical knowledge, and we have our technological knowledge. Uh, in other words, what are we teaching? What is our content? Our pedagogy, how do we go about teaching it? And then finally, where does that technology piece uh, fit into all of this? And how do we bring all of that together to get into that sweet center? Um, and the answer here, when you look at this quote, um, is that there is no one right answer, right? Uh, is it iPads, or is it Chromebooks, or is it Edmodo, or what is it, right? What is the piece here that we're all going to do to be an effective integrator of technology? And when we look at this quote from Dr. Kaler, he says, well, let's stop and take a moment to think here. Individual teachers grade level, school specific factors, demographics, culture, and other factors ensure that every situation is unique and that no single combination of content, technology, and pedagogy will apply for every teacher, every course, or every view of teaching. And so what that means to me is rather than taking the tools that are pushed down to us um, as far as technology is concerned and then trying to find ways to apply them, uh, maybe we need to stop and think about what objectives we want to achieve, what student-centered objectives we want to achieve, and then find the right tool that will help us meet those objectives, taking all of those other factors into consideration. And I think there's really three key questions here that get me thinking about the content piece uh, of the TPAC framework. And when I think about that content piece, these are the questions that come to mind for me. What is antiquated? What can we let go of in education? And these are always difficult conversations to have. Um, what is classic? What do we not want to let go of? And then finally, how can we take what is classic and make it contemporary? And I think that is the most important question because a lot of times, I think teachers, a lot of teachers fear that introduction of technology into their classroom, whether it's because of their own feelings of inadequacy uh, in regards to their technological knowledge, or whether it's because they feel like uh, students these days that are so immersed in technology and there are so many perils that can come from going down that road that they feel like they're losing uh, what's classic. And so there's that resistance to that technology integration. And I completely understand that. But I think what's important to understand is that if we don't identify what it's going to take to make that classic learning contemporary, we're going to lose kids anyway. And we're already starting to see this, right? I, from talking to teachers, teacher after teacher says, I just don't understand. Kids aren't as engaged with the types of learning experiences that I was engaged with when I was younger. They're just not as into it, right? And so what is the solution? How do we make the learning, that classic learning that we don't want to lose hold of, how do we make that more contemporary? And I think that's where that technology integration piece can come in and really transform the way that students 
engage with what we want them to hold on to, to that classic education. And not only can't engage with it um, differently than we did when we were younger, but get so much more out of it. Uh, but that's only, that's only going to happen if we as teachers, if as districts, right, if as a nation, uh, we really spend the time to backwards plan for those types of student-centered outcomes that we would like to see. One of the things that can be incredibly challenging as a teacher is that things are always changing. Uh, I don't know how many teachers I've spoken to that said, oh no, not one more thing, not another initiative. Um, I think more than any other profession, teachers suffer from initiative overload. And it really truly can be an overwhelming experience um, that we as teachers, in, especially here in the United States of America, where we have uh, the second most amount of instructional time, contact time with students of any nation in the world, uh, Chile being number one, it can be difficult to take on new initiatives and new challenges. And just looking here at, uh, in regards to the content piece, um, you know, we've got standards that are constantly in flux and constantly changing. Uh, we've got different uh, pedagogical models, right? Uh, some districts do AVID, some do GLAD. There's other, uh, you know, I was in a district that did PSYOP at one point. So these different ways that we approach our instruction, um, depending on the district or building that we're in, can be different. And then, of course, we always know that technology is always changing as well, right? And so it can be a challenge as a teacher to constantly um, stay up to date on the latest standards and the latest instructional methods and the latest uh, pieces of educational technology to really get to that point where we can bring all of that together in an effective way. It truly is um, a challenging task. And I think it really does, you know, one of the limitations of the TPAC framework is um, I think that it doesn't, I, th I like, I put this arrow into this framework because I think we really do need to go down the list here in a, in a three-step approach. So we really first have to identify what it is that we're teaching. Uh, I remember my first year as a teacher going to uh, the social studies department chair and saying, hey, you know, like, what are you guys doing here? And he says, well, here's a book that we've got, drops it on the table. I don't really use it much, but, you know, if you want to, go for it. So that, okay, wow, what am I teaching here? Uh, that was something that consumed a lot of my time in the first few years of teaching, just developing the curriculum, um, going through the standards. That took a lot of my time, so much so that I didn't really have a lot of time to think about how I was going to actually go about approaching that instruction. Um, so for me, in my first few years of, te of teaching, there were a lot of PowerPoints, a lot of stand and delivers, a lot of quizzes, and a lot of tests. Uh, you find out very early, you know, I found out very early that that wasn't really working for me. Um, so, but once I got the content down a bit better, I then had the time to think about, okay, how am I going to go about delivering this content to my students? And that's where some of those instructional strategies start to come in. Um, I remember being frustrated sometimes, though, that I didn't always have the time to plan my lessons out and employ these instructional strategies in the way that I uh, had hoped to. And so for me, there was a frustrating knowing doing gap where I knew what it would take to be a better teacher, and I didn't always have the time to actually do it and implement it. And that was incredibly frustrating. For me, what really transformed my practice was when the technology piece came in, and I was able to use technology to be a more efficient as a teacher and to streamline a lot of processes so that I had the time to implement the best practices that I'd wanted to try and implement anyway. And a lot of times the technology helped me to not only just save time in a teacher-centered way, but it also helped me to, I would bring the technology in to help facilitate some of these instructional practices. Um, and that made the delivery of my content so much better. That helped my students engage with it in an entirely new way. And it was really going through that one, two, three-step approach um, over the course of years and self-reflection that finally led to me being, a, I feel like, an effective integrator of technology in my own classroom. 
but that took a good seven years, right? It didn't happen overnight. And I think that's one thing that uh, we as teachers need to keep in mind. It can be overwhelming. So you might be looking at this going, whoa, can I really do all of this? Um, Rome wasn't built in a day. Here in Washington State, uh, we have a teacher principal evaluation um, program. And part of that, it has 41 different criteria in which we're evaluated. And that can feel like, again, another one more thing, right? But if we as teachers are able to take our content, deliver it using these instructional methods, and have technology help enhance those, um, all of that stuff in the evaluation piece is something that we really don't have to worry about. Uh, it'll all just come together. So I think, again, when you think about how much it is that we have to do as teachers, it can be an overwhelming um, a really overwhelming challenge. And I think that's especially given the nature of change in education, um, you know, with the way our society is evolving, it's going to continue to change faster and faster and faster. It will be get harder to keep up. Um, and there is that uh, temptation to want to close our door and do things the same way that we did last year and the year before and the year before because things change so fast. And I think that that would really truly be a shame because then we go about uh, becoming antiquated as teachers ourselves. And I don't think that's what's best for our students. I think what's important is to recognize the fact that things are going to change and that if we're going to keep up and meet the needs of our students, we have to have a growth mindset. We have to have a can-do attitude. And I love this quote by Carol Dweck here. Uh, she's the author of Mindset, the New Psychology of Success. And uh, she says here, no matter what your ability is, effort is what ignites that ability and turns it into accomplishment. And when people already know they're deficient, they have nothing to lose by trying. And so when we see the direction that things are going, when we see that we're starting to lose students, when students are starting to disengage more and more, my question to you, if you're feeling resistant to the change that's continually happening in education is, what's the harm in trying? What, let's put our best foot forward and see what we can do. And if we have this type of growth mindset and we model that in front of our students and we're not afraid to fail in front of our students, that's teaching them the type of mindset that they're going to need in the future that they are going into. And so being open about our practice, being open about the fact that we are constantly learning as teachers and that we don't have it all figured out and that we're doing the best that we can and that we're going to fall flat on our face right there in front of them, I think that's something that we need to be open about in front of our students. I think that administrators need to recognize when it comes to teachers and trying new things and encouraging that. Um, and I think that's something that we constantly need to be modeling. So what does the technology piece look like in that TPAC framework? To me, the SAMER model really helps me to self-reflect and think about what that piece looks like. I also like the SAMER model because I think it goes through, helps me go through the steps that it takes to get to that point where we really truly are redefining uh, what's going on in our classrooms. And it isn't something that just happens overnight. Uh, we really do have to have that growth mindset, and it does take time to get there. Uh, I also like the SAMR model because, well, do you see those coffee cups down there? Who doesn't like, what teacher doesn't like coffee, right? So you got to love this image. It, it makes me smile. So what is the SAMR model? Substitution, moving to augmentation, then modification, and then redefinition. Uh, with this being an enhancement and then a transformation of what's going on in our classroom. So let's look at substitution. Tech acts as a direct tool substitute with no functional change. An example of this might be uh, taking the textbook that you've had, paper, copy, um, a book in your classroom, and then taking that and having a digital copy available to students online. How is this um, any type of enhancement? Well, it's a little bit. Uh, if student forgot their book in their locker, um, and they had homework due that night, they could access the text from home and still get their homework done. So that's a slight enhancement. Really not a whole lot of functional change. We're still working with a textbook here, probably still doing worksheets, um, but that's that. Augmentation, how do we use tech then as a direct tool substitute and have some functional improvement? Uh, perhaps rather than just giving the student a worksheet, 
in particular for a student that really you know is at high school they're struggling with handwriting and that's a barrier to them being able to really uh, access the t um, you know the worksheet and be able to show their learning giving them a writable PDF where they could type their answers in there's some functional improvement there right uh, I think about this on the teacher end as well. I used to pull popsicle sticks to randomly call on students, and I had numbers and things set out on desks. Um, and then I had to replace those every once in a while because uh, kids would write on them, and, and it was a lot to keep track of. Using Class Dojo uh, as a way to quickly set up my classes and randomly call on students provided that functional improvement for me as a teacher and that time saving that allowed me to more effortlessly employ uh, that instructional strategy of randomly calling on students. And it also, because there was less mental energy that had to be spent on the randomly calling on of students, it allowed me to be more intentional when I called on the students. Um, you know, I'd randomly call on a student first and then I'd come up with the question to ask them. Uh, or, yeah. So what does the technology piece of the TPAC framework look like? Uh, to me, I really love the SAMER model as something that really helps me self-reflect and think about that. I love this model because it really highlights the fact that it doesn't just happen overnight where you've transformed and redefined uh, what's going on in your classroom through the use of educational technology. It really is um, you know, a multi-tiered process. And the Samer model talks about moving from substitution to then augmentation to then modification and then redefinition and it taking steps. I also like the Samer model because uh, what teacher doesn't like coffee, right? You love this, uh, love the coffee cups here. It always makes me smile. So, all right, so let's take a look at this. Substitution as a slight form of enhancement to our instruction that says tech acts as a direct tool substitute with no functional change. An example of that might be taking your textbook, which you only had a hard copy of, making a copy available to students digitally online. How is that an enhancement in any way? Well, if you've got a student that's forgotten their book in their locker for that evening and they had homework that was due, maybe a worksheet, uh, they could still access, access the text from home and complete their assignment. Right? Not a whole lot of functional change here. Students are still more or less doing the same things they were doing before but there was a value add to having the textbook available online. Moving then from there to augmentation, where tech acts as a direct tool substitute with functional improvement. Uh, an example of that might be uh, taking that worksheet that you sent the student home with, the hard copy, and making it available to students as a writable PDF. Uh, perhaps there are some students that, you know, we're at the high school level here, the handwriting hasn't happened, and that served as a barrier to them being able to show what they've learned. Taking that uh, worksheet and making it available as a writable PDF for that student would be a very functional improvement upon a learning task that was still more or less uh, a substitute, right, to what you were doing before. The next step is where it starts to get a little more fun. This is where we moved into transformation. And it says that modification, the next step here is when tech allows for significant task redesign uh, what might that look like? Well, there's lots of different examples of things I could think of. Maybe you're a social studies teacher and you have students in the past that created timelines. Uh, there's a number of really neat resources online where they can make interactive timelines where they include images and uh, have all kinds of things that go into that timeline that can really redefine uh, and redesign what that task would look like. Um, so I think about that as being an example of modification. Redefinition here is where it really starts to get fun, where tech allows for the creation of new tasks that are previously inconceivable. Uh, for some of this stuff, I think about some of the real-time collaboration that you can have using Google Apps for Education um, and some of the tools that you can employ to uh, engage students in project-based learning. And not only just collaboration within your classroom, but you can bring in speakers from other parts of the world with using Google Hangouts, and students can collaborate um, in real time with people from all around the world using the Google Apps for Education. Uh, this is where things really start to get really interesting, really fun, and I think that taking a look 
at the Samer model in light of Bloom's taxonomy makes a whole lot of sense in that it's not, sometimes it's not going to be total, we're not totally trying to redefine what's going on in our classroom all the time. Sometimes that basic substitution is really what's best for students given the context of what's going on in our classroom. Uh, there are times where we need to develop students lower order thinking skills, those level one things like remembering and understanding. And there are some technology tools out there that can really enhance that. Um, you know, one of my favorite websites is sporkle.com, S-P-O-R-C-L-E. And I used to go on, I used to go on there and just drill and kill on stuff like the presidents of the United States in order and the countries of the world. And that website was great and fun for me for that drill and kill stuff and really helped me remember, right? But again, that's the lowest uh, order of thinking. When we want to get kids to that point where they're really creating, where they're engaging in that highest order of thinking, there are also some technology tools out there that can really help redefine what that looks like. And so our use of the tools that we're going to bring into our classroom depends on what we want our students to do at any given point of time in our classroom. And we need to be self-reflective about those student-centered ends of what we want to see our students doing so then that we can go and find the right tool to help the students meet those ends. So there's not a one-size-fit-all answer for every classroom, every content area. Uh, it's really going to depend on the context of your class and your situation. To me, that technology piece, that incorporation of the SAMER model, uh, that really can only come if we've spent that time as a teacher knowing what we want to teach, thinking about how we want to go about teaching it, and then getting to that point of refinement where we're focused on the art of teaching and thinking about how technology can help refine our practice. Uh, if we lead with the tool, the technology tool, and we don't have that solid background of content and pedagogy in place, and we don't backwards plan for the results that we want to see our students having in the classroom, the integration of technology can be a net negative to our classroom and can be a net negative uh, to our society and the direction that we're going. And so it's that intentionality, that backwards planning, and that using technology to truly refine our practice uh, that I think is just so important. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that I've given you a lot of meat to chew on, a lot to self-reflect on. And I hope that you've left uh, with a feeling that there's that importance of having that growth mindset to continue to grow as an educator. I hope that you don't feel overwhelmed. Really just try to take one thing uh, and put it into practice every day. It might not be technology. Maybe today you'd like to take a closer look at the standards and see where they fit into your instruction. Maybe today you'd like to try a new instructional strategy. Give it a shot. You might fall flat on your face or it might go well. Or maybe today you'd like to learn some new piece of educational technology and try to put it into your practice. Again, just work on one thing at a time and try not to get too overwhelmed. Have a growth mindset. You can do this. Have a great day.